Okay, we're in the book of Deuteronomy. We're in session 11. We do, we, we do uh, two chapters at a session. We'll actually do two sessions, so we'll have four sessions all together tonight. The key theme, something I just, uh, I didn't want to review the whole book each time we do this, but there are a couple of things I do want to keep in front of us. And that is, this, this, remember the book of Deuteronomy is really four sermons of Moses. As he's recounting, near the end of his days, he's recounting their history and the law and so forth. So it's really, these are really sermons by Moses. But uh, the, there's a theme that runs through the whole thing that he's emphasizing, and that's God's love for them as a very special people, a covenant people, again and again and again throughout the, as he, as he, it's not just a, a, a list of do's and don'ts kind of thing. They're there each for a purpose, and each one is intended to convey the reality that God loves them as a covenant people. But there's also a flip side of that. He also emphasizes then their obligations to manifest His holiness. So that's the, that's the, that's the covenant. And in many respects it's, a, it's like a, a treaty or a, an agreement. God's done th things for them to demonstrate His love for them and expects in return for them to manifest His holiness as a people. And that, re that results in some very strange things. But as I went through this, there's something else that is involved here. You see, I personally tend to believe that most of us have no idea what the Second Commandment really is all about. I want second or third, it depends how you want to number them. But the point is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We all quoted it in, as kids or whatever. It has, I, I don't think it has anything to do with swearing. That doesn't mean you should swear, but I don't think that's what it's talking about. It's about not taking His name, taking on the authority of His name with emptiness, in vain. And what struck me is that's part of what He's going to emphasize all through the book of Deuteronomy, that since they are a covenant people, they will reflect Him as their God. And that puts an obligation on them to represent Him faithfully, accurately, as a God of mercy. Yes, a God that is holy, but also a God of mercy. But the point is, as we go through Deuteronomy and recognize that aspect, we probably will find our shoes pinching a little. Because I suspect very few Christians take His name faithfully manifest Him faithfully. I say that because of, uh, uh, we're all sinners. Our sins may be forgiven, but we're still the scoundrels <laughs> we are. I find that even in the literature. It's astonishing to discover how many of the doctrines that are defended by Orthodox theologians really end up calling God a liar, really end up disparaging a God who delights in making and keeping His promises. Anytime we cast clouds upon a commitment that He's given is impugning His integrity. So all of us, wherever we are, should, uh, I think, can benefit by recognizing our need to to represent Him more faithfully than we do. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 23. It's going to talk a lot about family life. It's going to talk a lot about various ways you can demonstrate love for your neighbors. And uh, let's jump to Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. He that is... <laughs> now, by the way, I warn you in advance, some of these little paragraphs <laughs> may strike you rather strange. <clears throat> That's because they are. <laughs> And, of course, they're talking about a different time in many respects. But anyway, let's do it, and it starts right out that way. Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. He that is wounded in the stones... <laughs> you guys can guess what that means. Um, or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. <laughs> now, <laughs> in other words, this excludes eunuchs. 
Now you'll find other passages, Isaiah 56 in other words, where the eunuchs will be welcomed. But what this is talking about here really, in the context that it's being given, is in the light of the contemporary pagan practices of the land that they were entering. And uh, they were told uh, back in chapter 14 not to mutilate the bodies, but again those things have to do with um, uh, the pagan practices that were very common among the Canaanite tribes that they were about to, to enter among. So, and I should mention very quickly in Acts 8 and elsewhere that uh, in New Testament times um, disabilities of various kinds uh, no longer enter into any consideration in terms of membership of the group. But that was not true um, in the, in the uh, early um, encampments of ancient Israel. And then we have this very interesting verse, and, and uh, by the way, <laughs> many of you will begin to tie if you've been to a lot of our Bible studies, you know you like to tie the Old Testament with the New. Like you quickly uh, remember where Jesus um, talked about uh, in Matthew 5, 29, verse 30, uh, Sermon on the Mount. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Now, if we were following that literally, I think there'd be a lot of blind people with one arms or whatever wandering around the neighborhood. Uh, Jesus was making a point, and he used extreme rhetoric to do that. Um, I personally don't believe that he really meant you to literally pluck out your eyes, trying to make a point of how important it is to be holy. And the whole thrust of Matthew 5 and 6, the so-called Sermon on the Mount, is to demonstrate that we can't make it. It's his interpretation. You think the law is tough. By the time he's through interpreting the law, there's no way you can qualify directly. That's really the point of the sermon. People say, well, I believe by the, I live by the Ten Commandments the Sermon on the Mount. Well, best of luck, fella. I know I can't. So I looked to a cross where he paid the price by living it for me. But um, anyway, you can, you can yeah, uh, look at that. This second verse is a verse that I, it's amazing to me how many commentaries miss the real point of it too because there's some background. Uh, it says, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. There are many commentators who say, Well, the tenth generation, that means you know, indefinitely, all the way. See, the whole idea of the sacredness of the... Con what's, what's at issue here in the law is to, this assembly that they're members of is a sanctified, sacred assembly. And so uh, they, in order to be, uh, not to be excluded, one had to comply with some interesting requirements. So that also meant that they excluded certain people. But this, this idea that an illegitimate son is excluded or cannot inherit for ten generations turns out to be what I would call as a computer guy a macro code. It anticipates something in the future. Now you may recall in the book of Ruth uh, at, the, uh, at the end, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the book of Ruth before the evening's over, but the basic thing is you may recall that uh, the whole climax of that little four chapter book is when Boaz, as the kinsman redeemer, uh, takes Ruth to bride. It's, it's, it's the big finish. It's the big positive ending to this incredible love story. But as they're celebrating the, the marriage and the firstborn child, somebody says, may your house be like Perez. Well, it sounds like a toast, except <laughs> if you go ahead and do, your, do some homework about Perez from Genesis 38, 37, 38, you may recall that Perez... The origin of Perez was rather weird. Uh, uh, Tamar um, uh, uh, didn't have, uh, 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 wasn't given a husband, so she poses as a prostitute with her father-in-law, in effect, and uh, uh, becomes pregnant. He didn't realize she, who she was when he uh, had the engagement with her. Uh, anyway, when she turns out to be pregnant, of course, he's really indignant, and then he discovers he was the father, and he realizes he was the one that was really at fault because he didn't provide her a proper husband. But anyway, so the point is, the child that's born illegitimately is Perez. And there's a, it's, there's a whole story you can dig out in, in Genesis. So when someone says to you, knowing all that, may your house be like Perez, you'd say, same to you, fella. You know, I mean, that's, see, it's not a toast, it's a prophecy that most people miss. And at the last, from Ver Ruth chapter 4, starting about verse 18 to the end of the book, you have, now these are the generations of Perez. 
He begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Abinadab, Abinadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Solomon, Solomon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. How many generations? Ten. So when Israel wants a king, God had planned to give him a king. There were discussions about kingship uh, in the Torah before uh, Moses even died, let alone the, the, the time of the judge. You know, so this is this is written in the time of the judges, long before um, Samuel and, and Saul and all that. Well, why didn't Samuel? Why well, he well, he didn't anoint David? Why? Because David was too young yet, just a kid. They want a king. They insist upon a king. They want one now. Okay, he gave him Saul. But see, most of us think that that was a knee-jerk reaction to something that wasn't planned. Well, um, God knows the end from the beginning, and he had planned David all along. And how do I know that? Because, well, for several reasons, one of which the genealogy is predicted in the uh, time of the judges. So a little background on the tenth generation business. But anyway, let's move on. Continuing this theme a bit, remember Ammonites and Moabites were results of incest, you may recall. In any case, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. So there isn't a ten-generation hiatus here, you see. This is because they met, and it's not because of their incestuous origins. It's a different reason. Because they met, not, met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Peor, of Bethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. So these are, these, uh, both these tri peoples were dispossessed of their land by the Israelites. They were excluded uh, from participation in the congregation, not because of their incestuous origins, but because of their endeavor to bring a divine curse upon God's chosen people instead of giving them hospitality. Their, their exclusion was because of the failure to extend hospitality. You know, it's interesting to realize that at the great white throne judgment, people are going to be surprised by how they were, how they're being judged. They're going to judge them by my, how you treated my brethren. And uh, there's three groups of people, the nations that are blessed, the nations that are cursed, and how, by the way, they treated the nation of Israel. It's going to be very interesting. Check it out, Matthew 25. Check out that very carefully. Okay, uh, this whole business of uh, Balaam is going to come up again before we're through. You may recall Balaam was hired by King Balak, the king of the Moabites, to curse Israel. But he wouldn't. He didn't. He tried, but he couldn't. And uh, God delivers Israel in a very, very unusual way by sh surprising them with grace. Anyway, nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loveth thee. And there was a, that whole episode that you can read about in Numbers is uh, wor worth your study, because Balaam was counting on the fact that if he could, he told Balak if he put the women around the perimeter and got, the, got Israel to sin, that God would judge, judge them. He wasn't allowing for the fact that God, that God is a God of mercy, and God blessed them anyway. So, but that's all mentioned up in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. That comes up again in the seven letters, seven churches. So you need to understand that background to really understand the Lord's letters to the church, the churches. Anyway, uh, continuing the instruction here regarding the Moabites and the Ammonites, uh, Moses says, Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. Boy, that's strange. God has put his his uh, cloud, if you will, on the Ammonites and Moabites. But not only has he done that, apparently, if somebody has done, if God has done that to somebody, we are not to seek their peace nor their prosperity. That's disturbing. That's disturbing. But that apparently is what's included here, because we don't want to go against what God's doing, do we? Interesting. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. Now here's a different situation. See, in the case of the Edomites and the Egyptians, they were not uh, abhorred in the same way. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because, why? Thou wast a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. When the host goeth forth against thine enemies, then keep thee from every wicked thing. And so we have this whole issue of... Uh, 
the uh, Edomites and the Egyptians. Now, the Edomites, of course, had a kinship with uh, Abraham, so that's a link, if you will. In the other case, the hospitality um, uh, shown to Abraham and Jacob's family when they were distressed by famine in Genesis 12, and then also chapters 40 through 42 through 47. So we always think of Egypt, the Egyptians as having, you know, Israel having been delivered from Egypt indeed, but uh, God is saying here they, he's giving them consideration because they did extend hospitality in the earlier years and uh, prior to the, the Pharaoh that knew not uh, Joseph. As a small point, by the way, the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph, we learn from Acts 7, if you understand the Greek text from, Philip's, uh, from uh, Stephen's presentation with the Sanhedrin, and apparently the, the, the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph was a Pharaoh of a different kind from the Greek term. It's heteros rather than allos as, the, as, a, as another, in the word for another. And from Isaiah 50, I believe it is, we find uh, Isaiah tells us that the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph was an Assyrian. He wasn't Egyptian. It shocks us maybe to realize that some of the pharaohs were not Egyptian. They were, they, uh, that's a title. Not an eth- not a, they weren't necessarily of uh, Egyptian background. And uh, the 25th dynasty was, was uh, Pharaoh Necho, was Ethiopian rather than... E- anyway, let's, we're getting off the subject. That's happened to me before. Let's move on. You think the one reason I use the PowerPoint slides is it keeps me on the track, but see, I still can wander aimlessly here. Okay. <laughs> Verse 10 of chapter 23. If there, be any among, if, if there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness that, ch- that uh, chanceth him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp, and he shall not come within the camp. But it shall be that when everything cometh on... <laughs> He shall wash himself with water, and when the sun is down, he shall come into the camp again. And uh, so this is hygiene, if you will, for camp life. And the cleanliness is critical. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, what they're supposed to do, of course, is bury uh, execrations. And if, where they fail to do that, of course, they can, you, when, when that's, if you, you, you may be familiar with that, if human excrement is used as fertilizer, it can damage the health of a community. And so... Uh, but holiness is, simple, is also uh, symbolized by the clean, cleanliness and, uh, among God's covenant people. Verse 12. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. Thou shalt... <laughs> and, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. And it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad. Thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. I don't know how you can improve on the King James. I think it's pretty as graphic as you really want to be on that subject. But we're talking camp, right? For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy... See, here's the reason. Part of it's hygiene, yes, of course. Part of it goes beyond hygiene. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. So they're to conduct themselves... In, in effect, acknowledging God's presence among them. Boy, could we learn from that, huh? I could go on, but we'd all get a guilt trip here. Let's move on. Verse 15. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best, and thou shalt not oppress him. So they apparently uh, were, were uh, to be hospitable even to this, this kind of situation. There shall be no more whore. There, me, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And uh, this, is, of course, uh, this is pretty straightforward. Um, in the next verse, we're going to find the term dog. The word dog there is a reference, is a term used for a male prostitute in the Hebrew. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these, both, even both these are an abo- abomination unto the Lord thy God. And see, it's interesting, the body of the giver is more important to God than the gift. And he wants us to be holy. And, of course, part of the background here, too, we need to, it, it obviously applies in a direct sense, but also it's certainly in the context of these incredibly lurid practices of the tribes that populated Canaan. These were satanically pl- 
planted tribes. If you understand what the Rephaim were and all of that, this was Satan had 400 years in anticipation of their arrival to lay down a minefield. And he did that in many, many different ways. So we really need to understand that, to understand what's going on here. You know, we, we look at shock with the uh, worship of Molech, for example, where they take a, a baby and lay it in the arms of this superheated bronze idol burning, burning their children. And we read about that. We understand from archaeological discoveries and so forth the, the practices they indulged in of, of, of putting their children in the flames. And uh, we're shocked by that. And what we don't realize is that our culture has found a way to do it even worse. Because we murder the children in the Holy of Holies of their mother's womb. And uh, it's a... Uh, so we, on the one hand, we need to understand those were different times. On the other, other hand, those times weren't as different as we might imagine. And clearly, this whole business of whores and sodomites is a, a topic throughout our land. As our culture, as our, uh, the people who build our, the structure of our jurisprudence uh, yield to the, the uh, appetites of these perverts and deviates and so forth. See, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not uh, homosexuality. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah that brought him down was the condoning of the sins of homosexuality. Deuteronomy verse 19, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Now, you really need to interpret this in the light of uh, Exodus 22 and Leviticus 25 and so forth. And we talked about this back in Deuteronomy 15, if you may, the first 11 verses you may recall. But the whole idea is that impoverished Israelites were protected from exploitation from their richer brethren by, the, by prohibiting loans, uh, interest on loans. That was the idea. Among the brothers, like being within the family is the point. Interest could be extracted from a stranger or a foreigner. Why? Because the context of that presumes that that's a business transaction and you're dealing with financing. It's a different issue. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thy hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So that's the idea. Now the, uh, we're going to also discover that there's limitations on the nature of pledges uh, in the next chapter. So we're talking about the interest here. The whole idea is that God is anxious for the, for the Israelites to demonstrate love towards their neighbor by giving them help but not to earn money off of it. That's really what they're saying. And in the context, of course, are those that are in need. doesn't mean you can't just lend to your brother on some deal, but if he's in need, the intent is you're supposed to be responsive to that need, that basic need. That's what they're dealing with here. Next is about a vows. When thou shalt now, by the way, understand nowhere in the scripture does it require you to make a vow. They're a voluntary. However, if you make a vow, you're expected to keep it because you are uh, impugning the name of God by failing to keep a vow. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. In other words, it's not a sin to, to, to decline to make a vow. That's your privilege. It's intended to be voluntary. But if you make it, expect it to be uh, uh, it, it should be expected to be uh, fulfilled. That which has gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. This kind of concept underlies this peculiar thing in the early chapters of the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. It wasn't their withholding some of their goods from the communal situation they were in that was the sin. It was their lying about it. And, and that was what you know, caused him before Peter to uh, be killed on the spot. Very strange episode. Um, well, let's move on. 
When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat grapes thy fill at thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel. And uh, this is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. If you're in the vineyard, you're free to pick a grape or two and enjoy that on your walk through. But you don't fill your knapsack with, you know, a week's worth of rations here. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle into thy neighbor's standing corn. <laughs> okay? Seems pretty straightforward. This comes up, of course, with the Lord. You may recall that, that uh, uh, when they, he and the disciples walked through and helped themselves and so forth. And the big bruja at that time, they did it on the Sabbath day. You know, It's one of those several episodes that Jesus demonstrated. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man, uh, for man not man for the Sabbath. So uh, Now, don't confuse this freedom that's here expressed with the law of gleaning. We're going to come to that in the next chapter. There's a different thing for the destitute. They were allowed to actually glean behind the reapers and take that home. That's a different thing. That was the widows and the orphans, the destitute. We're going to talk about that in the next chapter. And guess what? We've got to the next chapter. Okay, Deuteronomy 24. These are mostly laws of the family. But again, they're sort of episodical, different things. Okay. Lest everyone's comfortable, we'll jump right into this issue of divorce. huh? When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And by the way, there's a tra there is a key translational issue here I'll come to, but I want you to alert to you right now. Uh, this is one of those rare places where the RSV is probably correct. I'm not a big booster of the RSV for lots of reasons, but the, one of the things they did recognize is that the first three verses are a sentence, and the fourth verse is a conclusion. And uh, in, 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 in the translation, it has a slightly different impact when you recognize it's take the whole thought of the all four verses before you come to conclusions. Anyway, let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she's departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now this uncleanness that's alluded to earlier is not adultery. Many people assume it is because the word is very similar. If it was adultery, she'd be stoned. She had the death penalty. So it's some other kind of uncleanness. And uh, the reasons aren't mentioned in the text. It just implies that there is some good reason. And so the main idea is that this is intended to, to, to present what we would call, in our parlance, due process. If there's going to be a separation, then it should have some basic ingredients. That's really what it's going to deal with. And the, first of all, there will be documents that will be certified to give the woman protection. And sub subsequently, if she's, uh, she can't be remarried to the original guy if the husband that she picks up after the first guy dies or divorces her, she can't, she's not uh, able to go back to the first husband. What appears to be the tone here is God is looking for stability. There's an acknowledgment that there will be divorce because of the hardness of their heart. Even Jesus comments on that. But if so, there's still an order that is called for here. That's probably what we would call in our parlance probably due process. There needs to be a serious cause. It's unspecified in the text. There needs to be a writ of separation, definitively so, which implies that there is a public official somehow involved, and there should be a formal dismissal when she is left out of the house. It's got to be crisp. It doesn't hang around. It's, it's, there's a separation. That seems to be the flavor. And then, of course, there's, a, there's this whole business of, of the fact that uh, she um, can't, Subsequent events cannot allow her, will not allow her to go back to her first husband should her second husband die or divorce her or whatever. So it's a, move, it's, it's a step towards order, if you will. Jesus, of course, has his comments about this whole kind of subject in Matthew 5 and also Matthew 19. He said that, And Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. 
For I say unto you, this is Jesus talking, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery uh, also. Now, that, I, I, obviously, we live in a day which has a very different view on these practices. And it is interesting, I, 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 in a previous session we went through some of the research about broken families. But it's interesting how the research has demonstrated that in broken families, the children are permanently impact. People say, well, the children can always respond. No, they don't. Children from broken homes typically have a harder time get, uh, with intimacy, with holding a job, doing well in school. The statistics are astonishing. There's been many, many studies, and they puncture a lot of the myths that people have used to try to justify their own um, volitions. But uh, God is a God of order, and the family is the order He has ordained, be that as it may. Now, on the other hand, let's also recognize all of us, every one of us, are distant from God's best, best for us, too. So we're all sinners in all different ways, and God sent His Son to die for those sins. And so let's not lose sight of that, because we do have a God of grace. But still, God's, God's best plan is pretty clear. When a man taketh a new wife, this, this is a dandy one. When a man taketh a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business. Man, that looks pretty. But he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. That sound like a great plan? I don't know how they're going to finance that plan, but it's a, it's a <laughs> that was the pat pattern in ancient Israel. That's what you call a honeymoon, right? No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he maketh a man's life to pledge. The idea behind all of this is, see, a millstone was essential to grind food. And the idea is you could not, you could take, for, if you were going to loan a guy some money, you could take, you could take some security, but you could not take something that was essential for his livelihood or for his dignity, for, for the payment of the debt. So these things were indispensable for the production of food. And... Uh, their absence would threaten their health. So they couldn't use that as security. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and maketh merchandise of him or sell him, he, then that thief shall die, and thou shalt put, away, put, uh, shalt put evil away from among you. So the stealing, man stealing or slavery was obviously uh, forbidden. And uh, again, that's the rights and dignity of the individual. Uh, to be properly safeguarded is all, uh, is it, is all through here. You know, as you look at some of these things, it doesn't take much imagination to, rec to apply them to our own lives. Among Christians, we should recognize there's other ways of stealing people besides physically stealing them. Uh, you can steal a reputation with unfounded gossip, hearsay. Um, uh, I've been in my executive career of three or four decades in many different communities. I was in the automobile industry for a while. I was in the semiconductor industry, the computer industry, uh, mostly in many corporate boardrooms, over a dozen public ones and many others. So I have I've had the privilege in my four decades, five, whatever, of a, be, being in a lot of different environments. And it grieves me to conclude that the Christian community is the worst of the lot from the point of view of ethics. I'm not talking about morality. I'm talking about ethics in terms of gossip, hearsay, slander, libel. These are topics that are regarded with real respect among most of the secular environments that I've had the privilege of being in. Doesn't mean there weren't some bad guys in there, but I'm saying still that the, the culture in, that board, in those boardrooms were, that was to be exalted and taken seriously. And I'm just, uh, I continue to be amazed at the casualness uh, with which the Christian community deals with hearsay, gossip, slander, libel, whatever. You make the list. It's disturbing. Uh, but uh, let's keep moving. <laughs> Take heed in the plague of leprosy that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the priests, uh, that the Levites shall teach you, as I commanded them, so ye shall observe to do. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam, by the way, after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. Now, there's two topics here, really. Um, one of the most impressive um, 
warnings in the scripture was what God did to Miriam. Now here, if Miriam, who was the sister of the one through whom God revealed himself to the people of Israel, if she was, what was she stricken with, for, with leprosy for? What was her sin that caused her to be stricken with leprosy? Which in those days was, of course, a, an especially abhorred disease. What did she do? She murmured. She complained. And because of her murmuring and complaints, um, <laughs> and a rebellion in effect, um, the point that Moses is making, how much more would the average Israelite be ex exposed to the judgment of God? Not necessarily leprosy, but some other ways. So um, there's two things here. One is to, to regard the things he said about lepers keeping isolated, so, but also to recognize that uh, remember what happened to Miriam. And, uh, and that was, she was struck with leprosy for complaining. So guys, you can call that to your wife's attention when the occasion calls for it. Uh, and vice versa, right, girls? Yeah. Somebody said uh, that if I, was a, if I was a good guy, Nan would have nothing to write about. So I won't uh, go there. Okay. <laughs> When thou dost lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand abroad, and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring out the pledge abroad unto thee. See, again, what they're dealing with here is the dignity of the guy in his home. That's what, what and, and the, the, the underlying current here is that their conduct should be, be becoming to the God they represent. If a man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. Referring to the blankets that he would be required to have to keep maintain his health. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee. And it shall be righteous unto thee before the Lord thy God. In other words, yes, so you're going to take security, but you don't take security that's going to endanger his life, his dignity, his health, whatever. And, uh, okay. So, thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be a, a, of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. Interesting. He can be a hired servant that's poor and needy. He doesn't have to be Jewish. He could be one of the foreigners that's among them. Strangers that are in thy, in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Boy. Now here, of course, they're dealing with daily pay, you know, daily work for, you know, uh, daily pay. We generally don't pay by the day. We pray, you know, by the week or bi-weekly or month, whatever. But the main point is it's interesting that not staying current on wages is a sin, especially if you're dealing with someone who depends upon that. I won't start with the anecdotes of Christian attorneys and Christian doctors who will open the file drawer of their delinquent receivables. And that's their Christian clients. We are so imbued with God's grace and mercy that we fail to realize that there is an issue of diligence, an issue of responsibility. That doesn't mean that uh, there can't be uh, untoward circumstances. That's what, you know, Israel had their seven-year debts are forgiven. We have our bankruptcy laws. These things happen, and that's the whole idea of a fresh start. But the norm is to stay current and to, to honor one's obligations. The Father, now, also we now get into the, this whole issue of individual responsibility. The Father shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So there's no contradiction between this and the whole idea of divine judgment as described in the Ten Commandments and so forth. But this idea of uh, responsibility is crucial. Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's Rainment to pledge. There again is that issue. But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt. See, you want slaves too, too, Moses is saying. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. In other words, you were redeemed from bondage. Be, be merciful to the one that's in bondage. When thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. 
that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. And uh, so this is, uh, this whole idea, again, let's stay on verse 18 for a minute. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt. See, what Moses is saying, you were once in bondage, so keep that in mind as you deal with others. What's that good, got to do with us? Everything. Because we were in bondage too. And it's by Jesus Christ that has freed us from that bondage. And so we need to have, that should cause us to be merciful. That should cause us to go the extra mile and so forth. So uh, they were recipients of God's mercy. So have we been. Their love for God was to be wholehearted. And, uh, and that wholeheartedness to, towards God should be reflected in their attitude towards their fellow uh, fellow men. So should ours. It's interesting how that's all linked up, and, and Moses will tie that even up further as we go on here. Now we get into what's called the law of gleanings. Um, the whole idea was that if you had a field, your reapers could go through it once and only once. You couldn't go through it a second time, and what you missed was there for the, the, the destitute. This was their approach to uh, what we would call welfare. And behind the reapers would go the widows, the orphans, the fatherless, whatever, and, uh, that would be dependent on those things. And this is dramatized, of course, in the book of Ruth, where Naomi, uh, during conditions of famine, he, she and her husband and their two sons moved to Moab, uh, where the sons took wives. The, eventually the husband and the two sons died. So Naomi had these two daughters-in-law. By then, ten years have gone by, and she's going to, she discovers things are better back home, so she's going to go back home. But she'll go back home landless. She had, she had no property, but she should at least be among her own people. And uh, one of the two daughter-in-laws is Ruth, and she insists, even though she's a Moabite, to go with Ruth and, and adopt her people and adopt her religion. And, and, and there's a very incredible uh, state of commitment in chapter 1. Chapter 2, Ruth, being the younger, young gal, undertakes what she's supposed to do. She gleans after the reapers to gather uh, foodstuffs for she and Naomi who are destitute. And uh, she happens, that's in quotes, upon a field of a guy by the name of Boaz, who is the hero of the whole piece. She doesn't know it yet, but it turns out that Boaz happens to be a kinsman of, Na of Naomi, and therefore he's in a position to help them more than Ruth would have any imagination to uh, to, to, to recognize. So, but she, when Ruth comes home and, 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 and Naomi recognizes she's got a real bundle here, she realizes that what, what happened, of course, is that Boaz caught her eye and he instructed her weepers to leave a little extra and, and take care of her. And so she comes home very well taken care of. Naomi, uh, as a good Jewish mother, um, sees an opportunity here. So in chapter 3, she explains that Boaz happens to be a nearer kin, so he can, he's in a position to do two things. He can redeem the land for Naomi, but also, he, if he takes Ruth to wife, she will have a life and children and so forth. And so, because, uh, so uh, there's a, a scene where um, Ruth goes to Boaz and essentially asks him to do the kinsman's part, kinsman part, which, which it's not a prop. Many people misunderstand the situation and think she's propositioning him. No, it's, 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 it's worse than that. She's asking him to marry her and take on the responsibility. And he, he's willing to. He's anxious to. He's very impressed with her. But there's a problem that chapter 3 ends with, and that is that he's not the nearest of kin. There's another guy closer of kin. So the big, the big final scene is chapter 4, where Boaz calls the city council together and he gets the guy that's ahead of him in line, so to speak, and says, hey, Naomi sells a field and, and, uh, and needs, it, needs to be redeemed for her. And the guy says, no problem, I'll be glad to do that. Which, of course, is a plot problem because you're hoping he doesn't. You want him out of the way, so Boaz is a crack at it. And uh, as, a, as, a, as I usually try to communicate this, you, you, you would cast Boaz in, in, as a Charlton Heston or, a, or, or a, maybe a Harrison Ford or something. The, the nearer of kin you'd probably cast as a Danny DeVita or something. But anyway, um, so, so he's willing to do that, except then Boaz says, by the way, whoever gets the field also has to take Ruth for a wife. There's a factor there most people don't know, and I'll come back to that in a minute. See, the kinsman redeemer had to, uh, had to undertake all the obligations of the beneficiary, not just some of them. And he was not in a position where he could marry Ruth, so he passes. 
which is what you want, see? So what does he do? He takes his shoe off and gives it to Boaz as, as the commitment that he passes on the opportunity. And of course, Boaz jumps at the opportunity. He buys the land for Naomi, so she's taken care of. He marries Ruth, and that is what links Bethlehem to the house of David. Because they have a child, at Obed, and Obed has Jesse, and Jesse has David, and you, you know, that whole thing. So, so it's, a, it, it's an incredible book of prophecy, a very great love story. But uh, it, 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 it derives in part by two laws, the laws of the Leverite marriage and the law of gleaning. I'll come to Leverite marriage in a minute. But anyway, when you cut down, this is the, it's verse 19, 24, 19, uh, Deuteronomy 24, 19, that is one of the places that deals with this whole issue of leaving behind the reapers for the fatherless. And when thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. Okay, so therein lies session 11. <laughs>